Hey everybody, welcome to Drive Through Review 345. Today we're going to talk about San Juan, and this is the second edition of San Juan. Now this game was originally printed, I believe 10 years ago, well more than 10 years ago because it's 2015 now, and this also has the expansion and also some changes to some of the cards. So, a little spoiler alert, uh, I am going to do my top 100 this year. This is definitely on it, and it's actually risen based on the changes to the second edition. Uh, just a little bit of the history here. This is developed by uh, Andreas Seafarth, who is also the designer of Puerto Rico and a couple other games. And during the same time as this was being made, I believe Race for the Galaxy was also sort of being made in parallel. And at some point, the development and the design sort of forked uh, went in different directions. Uh, so Thomas Lehman, I believe, had something to do with this, and I don't know how much Andre Seafarth had to do uh, with Race for the Galaxy. So let me jump into how it works and uh, the basics of the game. It is a lot like Race for the Galaxy, and there's some also some differences. And then I'll come back and give you my opinions on it. So in addition to having some similarities to Race for the Galaxy, this also has some similarities to Puerto Rico. And San Juan, of course, takes place in the capital city of Puerto Rico itself. In a lot of ways, San Juan is really Puerto Rico, the card game. And you can see here a giant stack of cards. And again, this includes everything from the new buildings expansion as well as a bonus building, only available in this edition. Now players will get a hand of these cards, four to start the game. And each player will also start with one card face up in front of them. And this is always going to be an indigo plant. And if we take a closer look at this, we can see how these cards are made up. If you look at the two numbers in the upper corners, this is the cost to play the card in front of you or the cost to build the card. And just like Race for Galaxy and Glory to Rome and several other games, the cost is paid with cards from your hand. So if you wanted to put out another indigo plant, you would have to discard, in this case, one card from your hand to pay for that. And each of the buildings in San Juan has a special ability. You can see this indigo plant will actually produce one indigo. And finally, each building has a number of victory points that it will give you at the end of the game, in this case, one point. The other components in the game, in addition to the cards, are these role selection tiles, as well as this governor tile. Now the governor tile is sort of a start player tile. This is gonna move around the table clockwise, and players are just going to take turns choosing the different roles, starting with the governor. Also, we have the cathedral, which is basically a fancy card that there's only one of, and it's actually a tile that's set aside, so only one person can build the cathedral in the game. And you've also got these market tiles. When somebody does a trader action, you're going to flip the top market tile, and this is gonna show you the current market for the different types of goods that are produced in the game. So the way that a round is going to work is starting with the governor, each player is going to choose a role. So if you choose a builder or a producer, you're gonna be able to do that, but then everybody else around the table is going to do that. So let's say I'm the governor, I choose builder. It means everybody can build a building, but since I chose builder, I can build it for one less. And then the next player will choose producer, and everybody will be able to produce one good, but the one that chose it can produce two goods. So everybody gets to do it, but the person that pulls the role gets a little bit of a benefit or a privilege. So play is gonna continue in this manner until one player has built 12 buildings. That will trigger the end of the game. And then you're gonna go through, everybody's gonna count up all the victory points in all their buildings and whoever has the most victory points is the winner. Now it's worth noting that you can never have more than one of the same building unless it is a production building. Then you can have as many of that type as you want. And production buildings are similar to the indigo. They've got a special color in their background here we can see a silver smelter, this produces silver. You might have a coffee roaster that produces coffee and so on. The rest of the cards are called city buildings. Here's an example of the statue. This actually has no special function, just a monument, and it's just worth victory points. Now one other thing to keep note of is the six cost city buildings. These are very much end game bonus scorings. And there's a variety of these. For example, this one is owner earns an additional four, six, or eight victory points for every one, two, or three monuments. And these are varieties that you can sort of combo off of. So let's take a look at some of the roles. So the first role to look at here is the prospector. It's a very simple role. You can see the action is actually none, but the privilege is prospector draws one card. So if I take this, nobody around the table actually gets to do anything, but I get to draw a card. Now the next role, the counselor, is similar to the prospector, but this is gonna help everybody. So when I take this, each player will draw two cards, 
and choose to keep one, where if I take it, I'll draw three additional cards. So I will draw five cards and keep one while everybody else draws two and keep one. So I get a little bit more selection in my choices. And here's the builder. I've already talked about this one. Each player can build one building and the builder, the person that chose this, pays one card less. Now the final two roles, producer and trader, very much go hand in hand. If we take a look at the producer, it says each player can produce one good. The privilege, the person that chose producer, can produce one additional good. And when you produce a good, you simply take a card off the top of the deck and place it on one of your production buildings. So again, if I chose producer and I had a second production building, then I can go ahead and take it a second card and produce on that building as well. Now corresponding with the producer is the trader. Now this one is says each player can sell one good and the trader can sell an additional good. And as I said before, you're gonna flip over the top market tile and that's gonna show you how many cards you're gonna get in return for selling the goods. So we can see here indigo is always gonna be the worst. You're always gonna get one card for indigo. Now sugar in this case is giving us one, but sometimes, rarely, that tile will give you two cards. Next is tobacco and then coffee and then silver is always the best, sometimes giving two or even three cards. Now when you trade, you just take the good off of your card, discard it, and then you collect the indicated number of cards based on the market tile. And again, if you are the player that selected the trader, you'll be able to do this with two cards. Now those are all the basic actions that you're gonna do. You're gonna be doing the counselor, the prospector to draw more cards, get more cards in your hand. They give you a better variety of cards to choose from for their special abilities, as well as just have cards to pay for other cards when you go and choose the builder action. And then the producer and trader phase, of course, is a good way to get a lot of cards at once, especially if you build other buildings that sort of augment and enhance those different special abilities. Like maybe there's one that says, hey, when you produce a good, then draw a card. Or when you sell more than one good, then you get to draw an additional card when you sell. So there's a lot of different special abilities that are gonna sort of combo and weave their way in and out of these different roles. And you also need to be in, keep in mind what the other players are doing, what kind of engines they're building, because um, less so with the expansion, there's a lot more variety with the expansion included, but you could kind of go sort of like a counselor route in the base game and go more of the produce and trade route in another uh, style. So you've gotta be really still aware, even with the expansion, what players are doing and when it's a good time to make them, force them to produce and force them to do the trade action and so on. So let's take a look at these city cards. This is really the core of the game. Uh, the first one here is the archive. And you can see during the counselor phase, the owner may discard cards from their hand and or cards that were just drawn. So normally you draw two and you keep one, but in this case you could draw two, keep those, and then discard another one out of your hand. This next one is the gold mine. This is kind of a fun card, and it's just kind of to throw a building down maybe earlier in the game if you were dealt this. Uh, it doesn't usually go off, uh, maybe once per game. This says owner draws four cards. If all have different building costs, they keep the cheapest. So if anybody selects prospector, you just flip four cards off the top of the deck. If the cost to build them is all different, you take the cheapest one. It's just a way to get another card in your hand for money. Next is the black market. And this says owner may discard any one or two goods and reduce the building cost by one or two cards. Basically this lets you pay for buildings uh, with goods that you've produced in addition to cards from your hand. So this can come in handy. Next we've got the market stand. This triggers in the trader phase. And this says owner draws one card more when selling at least two goods. I spoke about this before. So if you've got a produce trade strategy, this is really gonna enhance that and ramp that up. You're gonna have a nice card advantage. Here's the quarry. This is a good one to build early. It costs four to build it, but the owner pays one card less when building another city building. So this can really compound nicely. Well, let's say you take builder, you've already building at a cheaper price, and now you're gonna get even cheaper of a deal. And there's also a similar card here uh, for building the production buildings. And that is the smithy. You can see here, owner pays one card less when building production buildings. Next, we've got an interesting card that is a little bit better than it was with just the base game, I think. I've seen this actually win some games or you know do well for players more often now. This says at the beginning of the round, owner may place one card from their hand under the chapel here. And this can be worth one victory point at the end of the game. It's a little tricky because you're giving up basically money to pay for other cards and you're kind of limiting your hand size. But if you can get this out and have some good card draw, in your tableau, then this will do well for you. 
And in a similar card, the harbor, this is owner puts one just sold good under the harbor and that'll score you a victory point. This is a little bit better of a card in my opinion. Uh, if you're selling cards, instead of discarding it, you'll put it under here and then these are gonna count as victory points. And this is really kind of a needed card because it adds sort of a, uh, you know, a shipping strategy to the game, which it didn't really have before this card was in here. And that's something that Race for the Galaxy kind of has over it. It's not Race for the Galaxy, you don't just build build buildings. In this one, you just build buildings, but now there's sort of a pseudo shipping idea here with the harbor. Uh, next is a card to library, and this allows owner doubles the privilege for every role selected. So when you select the role, let's say you select builder, you're already building uh, for one less. This lets you double up on that privilege, so you'll build for two less. So you can see this and the quarry, you're going to be building just about anything for free or cheap. So this is a very powerful card, not overpowered. I've seen some folks say it's overpowered. I really don't think so at all. Here's a pretty beefy monument. Uh, it's worth five points, doesn't do anything special, but it is worth a lot of points. Here's the prefecture. This is very nice with the counselor. Owner keeps one card more from those drawn. So if even somebody else selects the counselor, then you're just gonna straight up draw two cards. Also going along with the counselor role, the customs office. So during the counselor phase, somebody pulls counselor, you put a good on this card, on the customs office, and this good will always sell for two. So this is a very strong card as well. And this is one of the new expansion cards. Now here's another card similar to the chapel in the harbor. Once in the game, the owner may put any number of cards from their hand under the bank. So you do this once in the game, whenever the governor moves, and you can stuff as many cards under here and they're gonna be worth points. And kind of comboing with that is the tower. Owner may keep up to 12 cards. So normally you can only keep uh, seven cards from round to round, but this allows you to keep up to 12. And so you can have a lot of cards that you can shove into the bank. Finally, let's look at the hut. This is the brand new card in the second edition. This says owner draws one card if no good was sold. So this is a little bit tricky. We, there's some fact in the uh, rules. Now the way we play this, and I haven't seen on Board Game Geek a real clear definition, basically if anybody doesn't sell a card, then you get to draw a card. But that's rarely gonna happen if somebody is a trader and nobody sells the card. Uh, so we've been playing it, this might actually be wrong, but as long as somebody doesn't sell a card, then you get to draw a card. So there's a little bit of clarification I think needed on that one, but I'm sure they'll clarify it one day. So let's take a look at another couple of these six cost uh, end game kind of cards. Here's the palace. Very simple, owner earns one additional victory point for every four points they already have. Next one is city hall. Owner earns one additional victory point for each city building. So if you've got kind of quarry in the library kind of thing happening, this can be useful. This is the guild hall. And this one is slightly different than it used to be. Uh, owner earns one additional victory point for each production building. So that's your indigo, your silver, your coffee, and one victory point for each type of production building. This used to just be straight up two points for each production building. So this is a little bit trickier to score a ton of points, but it's still you know, possible. And finally is that cathedral, which I showed you at the beginning. Uh, this is interesting as well, because sometimes you don't draw a six cost end game bonus card. So you kind of feel like you got shafted. But here, the owner will earn four, seven, nine, or 10 victory points for other opponents six cost buildings. So let's say other folks have built three of the six cost buildings, you'll get nine points, which is a decent chunk. So that's pretty much how you play the game. As I said earlier, this is gonna be in my top 100 somewhere, probably top half, top 20, just to kind of give you a hint. I haven't really decided to be honest. It's definitely risen with the second edition. Some of the minor changes to some of the cards, the gold mine, I showed you the six cost uh, bonus point change. Uh, now the hunt is the only thing that's really weird about this and we can't for the life of us figure out exactly how it's supposed to work. It's either worthless or kind of okay. So we've just been kind of playing the kind of okay way as I described before. Um, yeah, so it's the cool thing is if you would have asked me with just the base game, no expansion, no second edition, nothing, I would say I would like Race for the Galaxy more. But especially with the changes in the expansion in the second edition, this puts it above race for me. And first, let's get the, you know, the elephant out of the room. This is much easier to teach and I can get more people to play it. But that's not always necessarily the best criteria to, you know, sort of critique a game, I guess. It is, it definitely should be a, something to consider. But to me, this adds some shipping, pseudo shipping, like I said. It gives you a lot more pathways to victory. I feel like even from the first turn, I have some decisions to make. You know, I've got to figure out which cards to get rid of because I didn't mention, but in the sort of the advanced game, 
everybody but the first player gets some extra cards and they discard down to four. So even that's like a sort of really quick pseudo drafting idea uh, that after you've played the game a few times, you definitely want to do. Um, this is a game that I've played about a hundred times, give or take. And normally I would say, hey, that's because I've played the app a bunch, but no, it's because I've been playing this game since about the time it came out. A friend of mine introduced this to me, I think 2004 or 5, about when the game came out, and him and his wife really enjoyed playing it all the time. And I enjoyed Magic and the Versus system. He's like, hey, why don't you give this a try? You know, I know you like to play Magic and stuff. So we played it. And I remember the first game I got it, and I was like, hmm, this is kind of strange. But then by the end of the first game, I was like, let's play this thing again. This was awesome. And so they said, yeah, we really enjoy it. And they mostly played it two-player. And so we played it as a three-player game. We'd have game nights, usually with about four, five, even six people. We'd play bigger games. Uh, but sometimes it was just the three of us, and we would play this. And uh, I really enjoyed it. And it really kind of fed into that whole Magic the Gathering aspect. Uh, you know, at the time we were playing a lot of Euros like Kalos and Power Grid and Puerto Rico and a lot of those style of games. And this is really also kind of before the Ameritrash stuff really started to come out. I mean, I brought Dragonlance to Game Night one night, which is like an old 80s horrible dragon combat game. Uh, it's kind of fun. But, you know, there wasn't really any Twilight Imperium 3, at least, yet, and there was very few of the other style of games. And so this was a nice sort of fit for me because I did enjoy Magic quite a bit. I do enjoy setting up card combinations, and, you know, in a way you're kind of building a deck, in a way, because you have a tableau of special abilities that you can sort of combo off with later, and it's just, you know, your deck's kind of on the table. And so those are different combinations that you can, you know, take the produce action or the build action with. So at the time, blew my mind out of the water and I was like I like this better than Puerto Rico because I don't really like Puerto Rico to be honest um, you know one thing that this does that Puerto Rico and Race of the Galaxy don't do is when you ship you like don't really have to ship I mean you can you pretty much just should ship stuff anyway but there's times when these uh, market tiles will come up and it's like I'm going to hold on to this or I'm going to actually ship the lesser of the goods because I'm not getting as good of a deal out of the coffee as I can. So I'll just wait to trade that later and just trade off some indigo because I really don't feel like, you know, doing a suboptimal trade. Now, it doesn't happen a lot, but you can do it. You can choose. And uh, the forced shipping always has irritated the heck out of me with Puerto Rico and, and Race of the Galaxy. I think it's the dumbest thing ever. <laughs> but anyway, I know tons of people will disagree with me, but it's, I, I, anyway, so this is really fun. I like that part of it better. There's a lot more card combinations. It does balance out some of the strategies, like the library is not as powerful, though it's still powerful. And, you know, there's some more six-cost buildings. Uh, there's a lot of stuff I didn't show you because I don't want the video to be an hour or however long this is going to end up. But I would recommend this. I think everybody should have this game. I mean, this is a game I love. Obviously, this is going to be my top 100. This is a game I think everybody should have. It's easy to get into. I still am thrilled about playing. I was very glad to pick up the second edition. And I really picked it up because of the Hut card. And the Hut card is like the biggest letdown. I didn't realize they were going to change some of the other cards, the older cards. But I think they've done a great job with that. They did take out the events. If you got the expansion before, they had these event cards you'd shuffle in. I like those be probably because I'd played the game so much. It kind of changed the game up, made it a little bit... I don't know. It was just kind of randomized things and it made it kind of fun. I wouldn't say they were thematic or anything. They're kind of silly. But I liked them. Nobody else liked them. I don't really miss them. But I got it because of the hut. And I'm like, oh gosh, you guys are having a new card. I got to check out the hut. Um, so I'm glad. I, I don't really miss the events that much. I would say pick up this edition. Even if you've got the base game and the, and the expansion, I would say if you really like San Juan, I would shed that and then get this because I think it's a vast improvement and it balances everything, like I said. Uh, just a really fun game, really revolutionary in a lot of ways. You know, Race for the Galaxy is based on this, Glory to Rome, Eminent Domain. There's a lot of roots in this game and the whole idea of like using cards to either be the thing or pay for the thing. Um, so just a really fascinating game and still fascinating. And I'm glad they've updated it because, uh, you know, I'm now I'm going to keep playing it some more. So uh, definitely take a look at it. A high, probably some of the highest recommendation uh, for me. So thanks, San Juan. <laughs>